Is it fair? How does the stream fare now? We're down to now. Hmm. Well, shall be patient. Greetings. Yeah, yeah. I adjusted the the mic slightly. Now, now. Now adjust the effects. Still have it on delay course. But I up the volume on the amp so I don't have to speak as loud, <laughs> right? So I thought this would be fun to do a reading. Now, let's see if I can sense through the web of weird what sound effect should I put it on? Or should I just do straight up chorus? That means no delay, right? I have hall. Let's see what else. Vibratone. That'll be like, zzz, you know what I mean? So I'm a kid in a candy shop now. <laughs> Ooh, okay. So we'll give it a try. If I need to, I will change the vocal settings. Chapter 21. The healer's cave. It was a large space with a level floor, Nelia peculiar kinds, lit by scores of thick, guttering candles, jamming massive iron holders. Here and there around the floor, small fires burned. A variety of cauldrons upon them boiled. The dome. The mass whirled and writhed slowly in the stagnant air as if it had its own life. Diane Kirk, Lou called, the name echoing within the vast hollow. There was no reply. Now would you look at this grand collection of marvels, Gila said delightedly. Let's take a look about, lad. But he's not here, Lou said hesitantly. He wasn't sure. From his impression of the place that he really cared to go poking about in, after all. But Gila wouldn't be denied. We'll not hurt anything. Come on, lad. Where's your old sense of curiosity? It's gotten a bit worn, Gila, Lou replied. Still, he followed the clown into the cave. They moved through the maze of things slowly, trying to make sense of it. It was a bewildering array. Long tables of rough planks were piled with all manners of objects, mostly bizarre, and Lou peered at them with mixed curiosity and revulsion. One area was clearly devoted to the concoction of the healer's powering mixture of aromas, some already ground by lay, ground lay beneath the huge time-worn pestle in a stone mortar. Fragile glass retorts, bottles, and strange contrivances, like nothing Lou had ever seen before, were linked in a complex interlace through which bright like some controlling god, a round copper vat squatted on the thick metal legs over a collection of containers in many styles, sizes, and materials. I would love to have a room like that. <laughs> That'd be cool. I can have a cupboard like that, a little bit. They formed a rich texture that might have been pleasing without the surroundings. Lou peered down into an unidentifiable, but definitely unpleasant. The table held a row of animals' heads in various toy taken apart by a curious child. 
He peered into another jar there and found it filled with eyeballs that stared back at Lou, as if startled at being disturbed, so they were animated. After that, he began peering more cautiously, not wishing more surprises. One long shelf was lined with human skulls, whose black sockets reminded Lou of his first meeting with the druid. Other bones were heaped upon a table below them. A complete skeleton hung from a post, the bones strung together with one thin core. It rattled dryly when he brushed by it, turned to grin at him with brown teeth. On another large table whose top was dyed rust from many soakings of blood, there lay a whole boar newly dead. It was slit from groin to neck and several organs were laid out neatly round it. Gleaming knives and instruments were unfamiliar to Lou were, were lined were, okay were lined along the table's edge unsettled by all the signs of death Lou moved to another area where stacked cages hold a variety of living animals hares badgers small dogs and other types of game he wondered what their purpose was until he noted a bandage on the leg of a dog he examined the rest and found several with marks of wounds in various stages of healing. These wounds, like a cut knife, like a knife cut, were always on a limb. On some animals, it might it had healed to a scar, barely discernible in the fur. On a young mastiff, the cut was recently mended. The fur had been shaved away and he could see the wound clearly, a fine line circling the lower leg just above the paw that had marks on either side. And he looked closer, he realized that the wound was sewn closed by fine thread, like the joining of two pieces of cloth. He was about to call Gila's attention to this when a voice spoke. What are you doing here? Come this madman's foolishness. Diane Keck stood in the cavern's entrance. She looked stiff and, and indignant. His voice was cold with hostility. We're not prying, Gila said cheerfully. We came to see your work. You weren't here. I was seeing to your friend, he told them moving into the cavern. I interrupted my own work to do that. So why don't you go and let me get back to it? Diane kept Doyle aware of that and not sure at all. He wanted to know more. But Gila was enthusiastic. It has long been time since anyone showed interest. The healer gruffly agreed. They're quick enough to run to me with a cut or a call or a cough, but my greatest achievements they care nothing about, says Dr. Frankenstein. And after all I've done to perfect the skills given me in the four cities, I've, I've even developed them so far that I can bring a sorely wounded man back from death. From death. Cheating to the subject now. He'd accepted the two as an audience and was venting his irritation with his fellows. You think it was easy saving your friend. You watched me do a few simple tricks and you breathed easy. But it was. We owe you much. They all owe me much, but do you think they appreciate it? He began to stalk relentlessly back and forth, restlessly back and forth. They sit and moan about hopelessness. Well, I work, and then they call my finest accomplishment a useless one. 
he gestured sweepingly round the cavern. Look at this. I've delved into things man has never explored. See this boar. I know the secrets of how it died. I've done the same thing with scores, hundreds of beasts and men. I've gone beyond the surface of how things live, seeking my answers. He led them over to the cages. And see here. See these animals. He removed the dog Lou had been examining, holding it up to display the scarred leg. The limb on this one was severed, severed completely, but I put it back on. His voice rang triumphantly as he waved his hand across the other cages. I've done the same with all of them, successfully, every time. He put back the first dog and took out another whose leg was fully healed, letting it walk round. See there, no limb, no sign of it having been off at all. It's perfect, perfect, and I made it so. That's interesting, you said. You cut off their legs so you can put them back on? He threw Gila a puzzled look. The clown shrugged in reply. Diane Keck noted their doubt. You don't understand my purpose, do you? You don't yet see the full significance. Well, come here. He led them to a large circle of iron set in the floor of the cave. Lift that, he ordered Lou. A certain understandable reluctance, Lou grasped a large handle and lifted. It came up slowly, pivoting on the large hinges. Cold air puffed up into the up into his face as it opened. He laid it back, revealing a hole neatly cut into the rock. Nothing was at first visible within it, but the eddy of white haze as the inner cold air rose to meet the warm above. Then it cleared away and they were looking down into a pool of liquid whose crystal clarity revealed its extreme depth. Suspended in the liquid on a hammock of fine lines, there was a human hand. It had been cut above the wrist and looked to have been severed recently. The stump was raw, with tendons and vessels clearly visible. The skin was a fresh-looking and red-toned as if it were still on a living man. It is as perfect now as the day it was severed. But why have you saved it? Lou asked, wondering, because, young man, that is not just a hand. It is the hand of Nuwada, once High King of the Tuatha de Danon. Now shut the door again. As Lou did so, the healer took up his restless pacing as he went on. Since it was severed, I've made its restoration my greatest challenge. The artisans have ga gave Nuada his silver hand, but only restoring the real hand would give him the kingship back again. I vowed I would do it. All these years I've worked, experimented. Finally, I have succeeded. You can put Nuada's hand back on. Make him whole again, asked Lou, recalling the tale of why the kingship had been lost to Nuwada. I can. And now that I've found it, they all say that it is too late. Only dangerous madness. He swung to them. You heard that weakling Bodur Gyorsel. He even questioned whether I could really do it, questioned me. The force generated by his anger peaked 
at this, and then, as if expended, was extinguished suddenly. As the energy failed him, he aged in an instant, his body sagging, shrinking down. Oh, why go on with this, he said, shaking his head in despair. Perhaps Bold Durg is right. Nuada has lost hope, lost the will to fight. Were he restored, restored to kingship, he'd be no more help to us in defying the Primor than Bress. Again, Lu itched to speak the truth, to tell the healer that no man could be so bad as Bress that he had to be disposed. But all he said was, if there was any chance Nuada's restoration would help you, wouldn't it be worth attempting? It's not as simple. It's not so simple, the healer said. Bringing Nuada here would be difficult. He is quartered in the fortress. Bras has never trusted him. And like I believe, it's worth the risk. And as little as I like it, admitting it, I'm too old, just too old. He lifted a small shining knife from those lined on the table by the boar. He looked at it, stared at it in the grip of his hand. Then he dropped it back. Maybe I'm too old for anything, he said, the voice heavy with defeat. Even I have begun to wonder if I really could succeed were Nawada brought to me. No, dying Keck, Lou said forcefully. I see what you've done here. I believe in your skills, and I've seen Nawada as well. There's a fire of defiance still alive in him. It would be worth the chance. I know it would. And any chance, no matter how slender, is better than waiting here to die or giving up a dream. Do you think so? Said the healer. His face lit with renewed hope, but it faded at once. Sorry, lad. Perhaps it could be done, but you'll never convince the others of that. There is no one who does believe who could accomplish the task of fetching Nuada here. Lou glanced over at the iron lid upon the cavern floor. His expression was very thoughtful and very grave. No, I suppose there's not, he said quietly was still lost in thought as he stood upon the hill to caress him gently and ruffle the thick mane of his fair hair. Lou, there you are, called Ain, walking up the hillside to join him. I'd wondered where you'd gone. He turned to her as she reached his side. She noticed his solemn look. What's wrong? She asked him with concern. You seem so grave. Oh, I, uh, do I? He asked, his expression clearing at once. He smiled guilelessly. I don't seem to, I, I was only admiring the view from here. It's very nice. That seemed to reassure her. She smiled back, but with a certain timidness unusual for her. I'm glad that's all. I was afraid you might be angry with me. That's why I want to talk alone with you, to explain about last night. She paused and then went on more awkwardly, as if each word took an effort to force out. You see, I don't like losing control of things. That's very hard for me to admit, <clears throat> to admit, but it's true. I didn't mean to hurt you. I really do like you. 
It's just that this is not the time or place. Do you see? Of course I do, he said agreeably. I'm not angry with you. We've been through too much together for that. Her face brightened. She beamed with relief and enjoy it. I would, gladly, she replied. The two set off from the green hillside. You know, this is the first time I've really had a chance to look at Aya. Enjoy it at my ease. He remarked as they walked. I feel like I've been running since I arrived here. I'm just coming to realize what a beautiful land it is. Yes, it is, she agreed. I've seen few lands as beautiful as Ire, or as harsh. Does that sound strange? No. It's what I think makes this a special place. He reached a craggy knoll where a single yew tree slanted out at a sharp angle as if reaching toward the afternoon sun. There, the two stooped and settled into a smooth hollow in the rock below it, where they could relax and watch the golden light playing across the meadows far below. Ah, very romantic. It was still and soft and timeless, like a pleasant childhood memory. Have you visited many other lands, he asked. A few. I've traveled with my brother. He hates staying in one place for long. He's forever seeking new things. I enjoy it, too, but at times I miss our homeland. No land in the world is so fine as that, not even I am. Each day is as soothing and gentle as this. Flowers always bloom. There is no want, no pain, no hatred. Sounds like it could become a bit tiresome, he said laughingly. She laughed too. Now you, should, now you sound like my brother. Even its beauties can't soothe his discontent. Ain, you know I've not asked you about your life before, he said more seriously. I felt it wasn't my right, but there is one thing I'd like to ask you. If it's within my power to answer, I will, she promised. Well, you said last night you were a human being as much as I. Does that mean you're wholly mortal? You can be harmed. In our own lands, we do not age, she explained. Although we can be killed or hurt. Here in Ayer, even that is denied. Beyond the powers you know about, I am as as vulnerable as you. How can Mananan let you take such risks? He asked in surprise. She shrugged. He needs my help, I, and I love adventure, as he does. She answered simply. Still, I'm glad you'll not be needing to take my, any more risks for me. He told her with great earnestness. Lou, after we return, after this is ended, perhaps you'll stay in the Nan's Isle, she suggested, adding in a gently enticing way. <laughs> hint, hint. We could enjoy together. The time is an uncertain one, he replied quite soberly. But... When he saw her grow puzzled at this tone, his mood abruptly changed and he grinned. We've this day here and now, he said. Let's think of nothing more but enjoying it. He climbed to his feet. Why? Don't we walk so why don't we walk somewhere? It will be evening soon. We'll have hands as if it were a natural thing to do. Gila was being shaken violently. An urgent voice was calling him in his ear. 
Groggily he sat up. Dawn's light filtered in to the druid's list, showing him Ain crouched over him. Her face was drawn with alarm. Ain, what's wrong? He asked, taking her arms. It's Lou, she cried. During the night, he took food and water and left the village. Her eyes filled with anguish, tears. He's left us. He's gone without telling us why. That is the end of that chapter. Next chapter will be chapter 22, The Return. So I'm going to take a break, play a little music, maybe come back and do more. I'm so stoked. My check, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're troubling the man, oh. Shining in the sky, yeah. was one circle around me. The flames say, yeah. deep down, you know. Hear me. 
Smooth and romantic as a spring day Till the night time comes and the stars come out and set Full moon in the sky I'm way on the way Feel it on the wave, on the wave, on the wave Got us on the way Like a burning flame Oh On the flame oh. Tender Tender oh. Simple is the way Love or fear, courage to overcome, overcome. Love over fear is courage and hearts flame. Destiny Feel Destiny She'll be dancing in the circle round Remember forevermore Remember forevermore. Right. Oh. Deep down in a hook soul. Way down in the undertow. How are the folks so, so free? Folks, so memory. Hey, yeah. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Freedom, say, how I feel is real, so. So don't hate me, I'm trying to live free. And my soul ain't cardboard, it's living memory. To the core of the earth, oh, deep down, grounding into the earth, I go deep down in a folk soul, living memory. Down to stay, hearts flame burn. Oh, hearts burn, hey, burn deep down. 
No hidden meaning, just a good way to explain it. No. Rainbow from the sea, trees down in the ashes, you know. We'll rise again, rise again, rise again. Symphony, easy on the way if you know what I mean. 
Easy on the way If you know what I mean Easy on the way If you know what I mean I'm a Cool range in the breeze Baby, come on home now Help range on the way Looking for the Queen Elf land to stay. Whoa. Feel your breeze. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the breeze, the breeze. Oh. Deep down in a folk soul. See the burning flame, see the burning flame deep down, oh, she is the flame, oh. we are the flame, we are the flame, we are the flame, we are the flame. Folk soul, living memory intact, you know it's heart's flame and it's coming on back. There's the ember, there's an ember that burns, yeah, yeah. An ember that burns, oh. with an ember that burns deep down, you know. Deep down in a folk soul.